Hello, hello, and welcome to the Watch Reactions channel. Uh, today's video is going to be a bit of a dive into the history behind the digital watch as we know it today. If you enjoy the video, please do like and subscribe. This old Seiko manual is really useful for breaking down the main components of an LCD digital watch. First of all, we have the quartz crystal oscillator that you'll note is tuning fork shaped. We've also got the different circuits playing the different roles in trying to harness the energy from that oscillator and translate it into the display. This is located within the CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductor circuitry. And then that translates over into an LCD display. So let's break down some of the history behind these individual components. So what you're hearing there is Beethoven's own tuning fork, which is oscillating at a consistent frequency. This creates a single sound, which can then be used to tune your instrument. This carried over the tradition from Handel, whose trumpeter John Shaw originally invented the tuning fork. Now this was perfected over the years to try and get to certain levels of precision. You can see on screen now an example of um, manufacturers trying to calibrate perfectly these tuning forks. And one of the devices which helped in this area that was interesting is one of the original tuning fork clocks or the fork clock. Interestingly, the clock element was secondary uh, to the tuning fork element here. So why quartz? Well, Jacques and Pierre Curie around 1888 discovered that if you put pressure on or squeeze quartz crystals, naturally found, they were later synthesized, this produces an electrical charge within the substance. This was known as the piezoelectric effect. Now this effect was used for quite a few different devices, including this ultrasonic detector that you can see on screen now. Now where else would a stable frequency over time that is electrically excited be useful? Well, that was within the radio industry. So Bell Labs with Horton and Marison uh, back in the 1920s first started to use some of this technology for wave generators. Now, it was only a matter of time until that was applied over to clocks. And this is where we see one of the first quartz clocks as early as 1929 that you can see on screen now. Now, even before and slightly after the war, before we really get into this technology, these were still being manufactured on screen now. You can see an example from Germany. Now, between these original clocks that we're talking about and the eventual quartz clocks that we'll get onto and the use of watches that are more electronic, we have this phase of electric watches. Now, I've done a video on this topic, uh, which you can see uh, on screen now. Please do go over onto my page and have a watch of that video if you're interested. Now, what makes a watch electronic rather than an electrical is the use of electronic components the most important of which was first discovered in 1947 by John Bardeen, Walter Bratton and William Shockley at Bell Labs. Now, of course, the role of a transistor is to be able to manipulate and control electrical current and you're able to switch things off and on, one of the components of silicon, which is obviously the basis of computing today. Now, these transistors were used early on in some clock examples, such as the one you can see on screen, and also in some of those electric watches that started to use electronic components to stop sparking at the contacts. But of course, to really progress, we needed the integrated circuits. So Jack Kilby from Tex Instruments is one of the key progressors behind this technology, as well as William Shockley from Bell Labs. Now it was the Swiss, much to their later misfortune, that drove a lot of the development in this area. So Roger Wellinger, uh, sponsored by many of the Swiss watch great and the good, founded the Centre Electronique Horloger. Uh, and this is the team that pulled together the first instances of uh, a quartz watch in the technical rather than commercial priority. So they miniaturized some of the components we were looking about before, developed this, which is Beta 1, and this, which is Beta 2, which was submitted to the Swiss competition in 1967, infamously competing up against Seiko and mechanical watches. They were later than Seiko, but Beta 51 was actually put into some commercial models, such as the Belova AccuQuartz, Rado, but also, as you can see in this article from Hedinki, Patek Philippe and all of the other great and the good Swiss brands of the day. So it's quite an interesting little rabbit hole to go down if you're interested in this area. 
comprehensiveness, it has to be acknowledged that Longines also developed its ultra quartz technology, but not quite uh, in time. An Omega's um, mega quartz model on these elephant models. Now, one of the problems with those early Swiss models was that they relied on bipolar integrated circuits, which required lot of, a lot of power to run. Now, the development of the complementary metal oxide semiconductor, or CMOS, by Fairchild Semiconductor, and marketed through RCA, that they called COSMOS, was one of the real innovative steps that was needed to really miniaturize this properly into watches. And the person who really uh, innovated in this area was Jean Herny, who used to work uh, at Fairchild Semiconductor, and brought a lot of this experience, and founded the company Intercell, that provided some of these original modules to those that bought them. Now, one of the main buyers of that technology was Suneo Nakamura, who led the team at Seiko, who developed a series of different quartz clocks over the years that got smaller and smaller and were winning these Swiss chronometer competitions up against the homegrown uh, labs over in Switzerland. The clock on screen was presented at the 1964 Olympic Games and the ones that you can see on screen now were in the bullet trains in Japan. Now, of course, using all of these ideas that we've already spoken about, this resulted in the module you can see on screen now, which translated into the first commercially available quartz electronic wristwatch, the Seiko Astron. So we've covered some of the stuff that was on the left-hand side of that diagram that we spoke about. So we've got an ex electrically excited quartz crystal oscillator that drives a, a CMOS circuit board that has a few components. But to get to what we know and love, we need to think, how does that drive an LCD or LED display rather than your conventional analog hands? Now, as the story goes, Stanley Kubrick approached Hamilton watches looking for a suitably spacey aesthetic for the film Space Odyssey 2001. It wasn't actually shown in the film, but is credited with being a real inspiration behind their progress in this field. Now, the LED or light emitting diode display was actually commercialized by Hewlett Packard. You can see some of their original promotional materials here. And a version of this was used by the Electro Data Company that Hamilton actually commissioned to make the first prototypes of the Hamilton watch that you can see on screen now. Now, of course, these light emitting diode displays had to be partnered up with a circuit board. So the one you can see on screen is the 44 integrated circuit board that was developed by the Electro Data team back in the day. Now, it is, of course, mandatory to include the infamous video of Johnny Carson showing this prototype, which he didn't seem he was that impressed with at the time. That's tomorrow. From time to time, we show new products, but this is wild. It's a, it's a wristwatch, and it happens to be made by the uh, Hamilton Watch Company and Pulsar. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> it's the first, they say, first computer program to tell time. And it has no moving parts, and it's a digital now, of course, we have the first commercially available digital watch, which was the Hamilton Pulsar. This was, as you can see, uh, in gold, which was exceptionally expensive, later released in a slightly more affordable package, although still substantially more than other products at the time, famously worn by Roger Moore in Live and Let Die. Now, of course, Hamilton Pulsar weren't the only game in town. Texas Instruments also created their own LED display and other companies such as Electronics that you can see on screen, as well as companies such as Commodore. You can come across some really interesting LED watches still today. But our diagram showed an LCD display or liquid crystal display. Now, one of the key components of this is obviously liquid crystal, which was found by Friedrich Reitzner back in 1888. And he found that there was this situation or pneumatic phase between solid and liquid for certain crystals where actually it adopted some of the principles of a solid in that it stayed somewhat organized, but it presented as a liquid. George Heilmeyer, who was originally based at RCA Labs, found that if you applied electrical fields to liquid crystals, that it produced some interesting properties, including scattering and polarization. I won't go into the details of this, but he was essentially able to manipulate these properties through application of voltage when liquid crystals were put between two plates to produce displays that were known as dynamic scattering displays. Now these had quite a few problems uh, in that they weren't necessarily always particularly legible to read and had not the most stable uh, of conditions. 
So although they were obviously a great advancement, they weren't the one that was actually used in the end to deal with LCD displays. But we do see the technology used in some of the first watches that went around the same time as LED watches. So the Microma watch I just showed up on screen and some of these that you can see now. You can probably see some of that milkiness in the background. Now, of course, within this area, it's surprisingly controversial, uh, some of the history around who originally started this. You can see some of this history in this liquid gold book on screen and a more controversial one of Mr. Liquid Crystal, uh, which argues that this chap, James Ferguson, was actually the person behind these original technologies. But the dominant uh, modality for LCD displays was not to be these dynamic scattering displays, it was to be these twisted pneumatic displays that were originally progressed by the lab uh, set up to do this at Roche, which is a large pharmaceutical company in Switzerland that was diversifying at the time. So something important to understand here is the use of uh, polarizing filters. So what you do is you take natural light that is coming through on one side, you put it through a polarizing filter, and what that does is make sure that that only lets through light that is oscillating in one direction, uh, in this case, horizontal. So it lets in the light, makes it so it's only going in a horizontal uh, direction, and then you go through and you get to the other side and you have a filter that is actually only in a vertical direction. So if you apply that as per normal uh, with no um, modification, what happens is that that would hit a brick wall because the light would come in, it'd be horizontal, it would hit the vertical filter, it wouldn't be successful, it would, it would be black. Now what you do with twisted pneumatic uh, rods, which is the, the kind of liquid crystal that's there in the middle, what you can do is you can actually twist the liquid crystal that sits between those two polarizing sheets and make it so that the natural situation is that the light will come in, it will go through horizontally, it will then rotate uh, 90 degrees and then make it so that the light can actually go out the other side and be vertical. The properties that this helps is that uh, the natural situation will be that the light will be let through and you'll have a lovely positive display. But if you then apply a voltage um, through a, a circuit to, to that particular uh, module, then what happens is that it then turns black because um, you stop that kind of twisting effect. What comes out of this is displays like the ones you can see on screen now, uh, marked as the Roche uh, display here, which can show digits in nice fashion. The first watch to actually demonstrate this was the Gruen Teletime, uh, which is the watch that you can see on screen now. Now you'll see that this watch has a three digit or four digit if you were to go, for example, to 1239 display. Now the first watch that actually went to a six digit display, which was able to also include the seconds, was the Seiko Quartz model that you can see on screen now a world first in this area for Seiko. Now at this time, US manufacturers and Swiss manufacturers were still very present in this field. So Fairchild Semiconductor, you saw some of those examples. National Semiconductor had its own modules. Texas Instruments had this very interesting uh, pseudo analog display that I thought would be interesting to show here. Microma that was linked into Intel that was also made available and also Timex with uh, one of their precursors to their more infamous digital watches with its solid state quartz module. Now I'm not going to go into lots of detail on this here because I explored a lot of this within a different video, 10 digital watch rabbit holes you can go down. If you've not seen it, uh, please do go and view that video. Now, for those that aren't familiar, Switzerland actually did have quite a few of its own digital LCD watches at the time from a few different actors. Um, they never really fully went for it like the US and Japanese uh, companies as they realized quickly there wasn't going to be so much value. One of the last hurrahs uh, was the memo sale, which you can see on screen now, which was a yachting regatta watch. Now, there was lots and lots and lots of companies in the US that were developing these digital watches at the time, the most infamous of which was Timex, uh, later going on to develop the Ironman. And this is just the start. So in this book, you can see on screen now, electrifying the wristwatch, there's a comprehensive list. In Japan, lots and lots of different actors, uh, but over time, uh, they also realized that the production was going over to Hong Kong, and it's only really Casio that ever really left uh, with uh, continuing in this field. And I think the story of Casio is an interesting one, and probably one I'll come back to in a bit more detail. So obviously they were more primarily in the calculator industry, which had lots of overlap with LCD displays showing off one of my classic uh, 86 Texas Instruments calculators on the screen now, so US we're still in this game. You can see one of the first Casio products on screen now in that field, which was the Casio Mini. 
and their first entrant into the kind of digital LCD watch realm was the Casio Tron, which was kind of their precursor to F91W, G-Shocks and the rest, which we'll come back to in other videos. As we've noticed, most of the folks uh, outside of the, the lower value Hong Kong distributors of digital watches fled this field uh, between the kind of mid 80s to 90s, other than Timex and Casio, who really kind of trooped on and continued to contribute. I think the Casio story is a particularly interesting one and one we might come back to, but that's the end of this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you did so, please do consider liking and subscribing, and you can follow me over at Watch Reactions on Instagram. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.